uh, actually few sites online. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Bakar Azim uh, from Qatar. Most of you know me uh, who are online. So I will just introduce our uh, wonderful speaker to you and then I will let uh, Dr. Stubi do her presentation. Uh, Dr. Stubi is a wonderful colleague of mine. We have worked together for a long time and uh, she has graciously accepted this invitation to present uh, for us. So I'm pretty sure uh, you will uh, enjoy this presentation and learn from it. So regarding Dr. Stubi, uh, she received her medical degree from University of Arizona and her psychiatry and child allocation psychiatry residency training from Yale University School of Medicine. She's currently an associate professor and program director of the child and lesson psychiatry uh, program at Yale, as well as Albert J. Solnit Integrated Psychiatry and Child Adolescent Psychiatry Research Residency Training Program at Yale. She's Associate Medical Director of the Yale New Haven Children's Hospital Inpatient Service. Nationally, she's a member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Committee on Training and Education, the American Association of Directors of Psychiatry Residency Training Executive Council, member of American College of Psychiatrists, uh, editorial, uh, on the editorial board, and a member of American College of Graduate Medical Education Psychiatry Residency. Uh, one thing I think uh, is important to know, and some of you might already know, that uh, when College of Physician and Surgeon announced the Child Psychiatry Fellowship or FCPS in Pakistan, uh, Dr. Stubi has worked uh, with us uh, quite closely in uh, putting the curriculum together, MCQs together, so we are very thankful for her role in child FCPs in Pakistan. So I will have uh, Dr. Stubi take over from here, and I hope you will enjoy this presentation. Hello, thank you for being here this morning. Um, from Connecticut, where it's actually night. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about anxiety disorders in children and adolescents and doing an update on what we know about um, how to treat child and adolescent anxiety disorders. So today what we will plan to do is to learn about the unique characteristics of anxiety disorders in children and adolescents and understand some of the diagnostic and treatment challenges related to them, particularly in children who may have a number of different diagnoses, and to be able to describe the evidence base for medication as well as psychosocial treatments for anxiety disorders in children. Now, anxiety um, is expected developmentally. It's actually quite normal in a number of times during childhood. For example, stranger anxiety, which starts at about nine months um, in the first year of life, is an expected developmental stage. And if we don't see some anxiety disorders, sometimes we worry. Separation anxiety is fairly normative in toddlers and preschoolers. And most children do go through some fears at night, for example, thinking that there might be monsters in the closet or something under the bed, um, feeling frightened to go to sleep at night, maybe some nightmares, occasionally night terrors. Um, and that is fairly normative during the toddler preschool and sometimes beyond. Fear of injury or death is usually preschool, um, but as children become more aware that um, individuals can die and death is permanent, that can be an area of anxiety as well that can be considered normative. Now, an anxiety disorder happens when the child is anxious too much of the time when it becomes functionally impairing, it interferes with functioning in their family, social, school, and other areas of life, and tends to be anxious about things that aren't really a real threat. So children who become really quite obsessed 
and absorbed with feeling nervous about things that other children their age would not feel similarly. The signs of anxiety disorders in children include behavior, emotion, and thoughts. For the behavior, children tend to avoid things that other children don't. For example, they may have some problems sleeping alone, staying home alone if they're young, um, speaking with other people, fear of animals, School and social activities can be anxiety provoking. And then the emotional reactions tend to be out of proportion to the situation. So they may become quite fearful in a situation where another child may be just mildly anxious. Um, they may also become angry. One of the areas that maybe we don't think about with anxious kids is that sometimes they become um, quite angry, irritable, and have other sorts of negative responses in addition to avoidance. They may also have a lack of interest in social activities, other activities, and tend to use avoidance. The thoughts tend to have a negative bias. Worry, some bad thoughts, bad dreams, always expecting the worst, and asking parents for reassurance excessively. Children who really cannot be reassured enough. For the physiology, these are children who may have signs of panic, racing heart, shallow breathing, trembling, dizziness. They may also have physical symptoms of their anxiety, like headaches and stomach aches, nausea or vomiting. And they may have evidence of freezing, clinging, sleep problems, or other areas that may demonstrate their anxiety. There are a number of kinds of anxiety disorders, and basically children can have those that adults have, um, as well as some that are more common in children. Separation anxiety disorder tends to be a childhood anxiety disorder. Um, when the anxiety really comes about when they have a separation, usually from the parent that they're closest to, but um, occasionally it can be somewhere else um, or even from home. Social anxiety tends to occur in children that may have a temperament that is um, reticent or slow to warm up. These are kids who get very fearful when they have to speak in public, when they meet new people, and um, being in new social situations. Selective mutism tends to occur in younger children. These are kids who can speak just fine and usually do so at home, but when they get to school or other social situations, they may freeze up and not speak at all. Occasionally, um, they will whisper to a friend, but oftentimes they will not speak. Specific phobias are what we think about for children who maybe have a fear of dogs or a fear of bees, um, but there's a just a specific object um, that is the source of their fear. When that object isn't around, they may not have excessive anxiety at all. Panic disorder occurs in children, adolescents, and adults, um, and it tends to be surges of anxiety which often seem to come out of the blue. There may not be a specific trigger, or there may be, but it does include physiologic reactions, palpitations, feel that they can't catch their breath, um, oftentimes they feel like they might die, that they're going crazy, and sometimes the panic attacks um, are very brief, but occasionally they last for several hours. Agoraphobia is usually the fear of um, situations and not being able to escape, such as in a bus or a mall, sometimes just being out in public in general. 
generalized anxiety disorder is when a child, adolescent, or adult feels anxious most of the time, almost every day, so that they just have a baseline heightened anxiety. And um, oftentimes they become really quite fatigued because of this. And because of their anxiety, they may not be able to access all of their cognitive strengths, meaning that they don't do as well in school or at work because the anxiety interferes with their thinking. Obsessive compulsive disorder in DSM-5 has been relabeled as an impulse control disorder. Um, however, it has always been in the anxiety disorder area. And people with OCD frequently do have very high levels of anxiety, wanting things to be just right. And so I included it here. It, anxiety disorders are quite common. About 10 to 20% of children will suffer from an anxiety disorder at some point, and it does tend to run in families. We think it's heritable, and between 20 and 65%, which means that we really don't know what the heritability is, but we know that um, it can impact anxiety disorders in kids. Childhood temperament is important. Um, Children who are slow to warm up frequently can go on to have an anxiety disorder later in childhood or adulthood. And um, those children that seemed to um, not have any difficulties with being fearful as a young child frequently are at less risk. It may develop in the context of adversity, for example, um, a trauma, something that happens that may trigger anxiety in any child, um, may trigger a prolonged anxiety disorder in some children. Oftentimes, these are children because of the heritability, a parent may have an anxiety disorder as well. And um, that modeling of seeing that the parent is anxious about things can impact the child as well. Parents often will want to help their child not feel so upset. And that leads to something called accommodation. This is when the parents try to help the child avoid a situation that makes them anxious. They may um, try not to have them go in public, make sure that they don't see a bee ever, whatever the source of the child's anxiety is, a parent typically will try to protect their child from that. The problem with accommodation is that the more the child does not encounter the fearful object, the more it becomes a more permanent disorder. So in fact, we know that some of the treatments for anxiety disorders are exposure. So parents who are attempting to protect their child by accommodating may in fact be making the problem worse. Um, anxiety disorder, we know um, that individuals with anxiety disorders have some neurobiological differences. Um, neuroimaging, this is a fairly complicated slide, but basically what we know is that we have frontal lobe, amygdala, and limbic system all in, um, in interchanges constantly. And what we believe is that children with anxiety disorders have much less modulation by their frontal lobe and more with the limbic and thalamic areas than do children who don't have an anxiety disorder. So the areas that are, these are all of the areas that may be um, anticipated to be activated or co-activated in an anxiety disorder and what the authors at Kenz and Wagner found was that individuals who have amygdala 
um, to frontal lobe decreases, that's this line here, tend to have more anxiety than those in which the frontal lobe can actually modulate the anxiety. So we think that connections can be very important in anxiety disorders and the decreased activity between the various areas of the brain that help with modulation, executive functioning, and the ability to sort of think about um, possible outcomes um, can be disrupted in childhood anxiety disorders. Now, for assessment, what might we do? Well, there's a number of screening tools. So frequently what um, we ask pediatricians or other primary care doctors to do is to do basic screening for children when they come in um, around a variety of areas, depression, ADHD symptoms, anxiety and trauma symptoms. And one of the areas that the pediatricians use a lot is the Vanderbilt Assessment Scale. And on this, it looks at a number of different disorders. These particular questions are the one related to anxiety. The one we use most here at Yale is the SCARED, the Screening for Child Anxiety and Related Disorders. Um, this is a screening tool that um, is specific to children and to anxiety. And then there's the GAD-7 scale, which is for generalized anxiety disorders. As a research tool, there's the anxiety disorder interview schedule for children. This is much more intensive, not a screener. It's actually um, a fairly robust scale that um, looks at many areas of anxiety for children and can be, is particularly used in research. When we think about an assessment of an anxiety disorder, we do want to make sure that we're not missing um, some of the physical causes that you might think could cause somewhat similar disorders. For example, um, hyperthyroidism can sometimes um, appear as anxiety. Caffeine drinks, substance use, um, those areas can in fact look like anxiety some medication side effects, migraines, headaches, and other types of disorders can also sometimes appear as anxiety. Children who have cardiac defects where they may have um, palpitations intermittently may feel quite anxious as well. But probably the most common thing to really think about and, and make sure that kids aren't drinking too many caffeine drinks or other types of substances. Um, make sure that you get data from home, school, um, as well as the child, because all of these areas are um, areas where the child, people who know the child best, and they can be very helpful in understanding what the child is going through. Family history is also important, particularly anxiety and depression and the child and adolescent interview. Um, talking to the child or adolescent, getting a history, when did it start, have they had traumas, um, any other stressors that might explain the onset of the disorder. Um, stomach aches, headaches, those are very common, particularly before school for kids who are nervous about going to school. Um, Typically, we do um, hope to get a full workup, but on the other hand, thinking and um, getting psychiatric treatment and assessment during the time that this is happening will speed things along. Thinking about, have there been traumas? Is there family tension? Are there many things that would make a, you know, any of us anxious and children anxious? Um, is the sleep problem, the anxiety, is it a new onset? Um, at least in the U.S., but probably everywhere, there's something that I call cyber drama, meaning that um, 
social media and all of the back and forth that can happen um, with kids, mainly with adolescents, um, and who did what and, you know, what someone might say about someone else, um, this can frequently trigger anxiety in children. Embarrassment, humiliation, being bullied, all of those things. School avoidance is an area that it can be particularly difficult to treat, and it is something that I call a psychiatric urgency. Not an emergency exactly, but we do want to make sure that we treat it quickly before it becomes more chronic. Um, so many kids don't necessarily want to go to school every day, but most do anyway, and um, it's developmentally expected, and um, if there are some issues at school that can be addressed, frequently kids will go to school without any difficulty at all. But for some kids, school becomes a really anxious place for them. Um, these may be kids that have had something embarrassing or upsetting happen at school, um, and sometimes we can't tell exactly what happened. They may have sleep problems, um, and it can get quite serious and quite chronic if it's not addressed fairly quickly. This um, looks a little bit at sort of the circle of school refusal behavior. So a child um, may want to escape from a negative emotion. Something happened at school. Maybe someone said something. They got a bad grade. A teacher said something to them. And so they begin to avoid school to escape from the negative emotion or from what they consider social evaluation in school that um, causes anxiety. When they stay home from school then, they may get tangible reinforcements, meaning when they stay home they may be able to sit and um, you know, eat what they want, snack during the day, watch TV, um, things that they enjoy. Or they may get more attention from parents. Um, they may be able to be with little siblings that don't go to school yet, so they get more attention, and then this may, in fact, cause the cycle to increase. So um, if they begin to miss days, there are several things that happen. One, the child learns that staying home actually is possible. They, may, they don't actually have to go to school because they've noticed that um, when they stay home, um, they have managed to be able to avoid school. Then they get the secondary gains, as mentioned, by more attention or being able to do more preferred activities. When they miss class material or begin to worry about what am I going to say to my peers when I come back, um, those things all then make it harder to get back to school and then lead to more missed days and then the cycle continues. Trying to get a child back to school quickly is really important. So setting specific expectations of um, sometimes for adolescents that um, aren't getting up very early, they're not able to sleep very well, um, you might even start with part of a day, the afternoon, but you set the expectations, stay very matter-of-fact and supportive, um, and avoid giving medical excuses. This is something that some of the pediatricians in our area will do. Well, you know, it's okay for them to have a mental health day every once in a while, or they have a stomach ache, you know, it'll probably go away in a few days. But then the more excuses they get, the more it's hard to get back to school. There's some practical advice, um, such as having um, their best friend accompany them into school, having them um, be with a favored teacher, et cetera. 
it's really important that all the adults are on the same page, the school personnel and teachers, the family, the mental health providers that the child has, the pediatrician or primary care doctor, as well as the child should all know what the plan is and all continually reinforce the plan so that the child isn't getting mixed messages and removing temptations from being home. So a child who stays home should not be able to play, um, watch TV all day or to um, be on their computer, et cetera, so that there isn't the secondary gain of staying home. What are the treatments for anxiety disorders? Well, it really is important that the family is involved in treatment, especially children for children and adolescents. Um, parents are extremely important in being able to reassure the child and ensure that whatever plans are made are followed through. Psychoeducation is first. Families frequently don't really understand what is happening to their child. So just helping them understand what is an anxiety disorder, what does it look like, what is, is it caused by, um, and for panic, et cetera, knowing that it's not medically um, endangering the child can be helpful. There's a fairly new program called Coping and Promoting Strength. This is a family-focused treatment that has been found to be effective in decreasing the child's anxiety. So it's helping the parents learn some cognitive behavioral strategies for working with their child and helping their child um, decrease their anxiety and teaching the parents not to accommodate. In other words, um, not to avoid everything that makes their child anxious, um, as that tends to just increase the anxiety. Here is the Coping and Promoting Strength program. This is a program that was started when at least one parent had an anxiety disorder. It's a prevention program. So we know that if a parent has an anxiety disorder, the child is at increased risk. So the intervention is actually with the parents. It's an hour a week for eight weeks. It includes psychoeducation, what is anxiety and an anxiety disorder. It helps the parents identify signs of anxiety. It allows cognitive restructuring, trying to help via cognitive behavioral therapy for the parent not to be so anxious and to restructure how they understand the situation so that they don't have the anxiety response. It includes in vivo desensitization, meaning that working with the parents to help them be desensitized um, to whatever makes them anxious. And contingency management. This is when the family manages the contingencies around when the child gets something or doesn't get something and can be very helpful in terms of rewarding kids for appropriate behavior. So this um, is a little graph of the results that the group found. So there was a control group that got information monitoring only. So this is the first eight weeks here, first eight weeks here. This is considered the control group. So they got information and it seemed to help, this is their child, it helped their child be a little less anxious, but then it pretty much um, evened out. This is the coping and promoting strength group. In the first eight weeks during the intervention, um, the child's anxiety decreased quite a bit, and then it continued to decrease over time, even without the intervention. And um, the reason that they believe that to be true is that the parent has found ways of managing their anxiety so the child is not modeling from the parent about anxiety 
and the parent is continuing to help teach the child how to manage their own anxiety. So the severity of the anxiety was less for the kids who got the coping and promoting strength treatment. Other types of treatment for the child include psychotherapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is probably still the best um, treatment we have for anxiety. Um, it also can include um, extinction or um, kids being exposed to what they're afraid of. Relaxation is typically part of all of the treatments for anxiety disorders. Mindfulness training, helping kids um, be mindful of what their body feels like before responding. And attention bias modification. Kids who are anxious tend to notice things much more that um, might cause fearfulness or might make them anxious and tend to not notice those things that might be reassuring, um, social, and help them think that things aren't anxiety provoking. So thinking about attention bias and how to help kids um, not just notice the things that may be upsetting to them, but remember that um, during the day, both things have happened and help them remember the positive things as well as the negative things. In schools, progressive desensitization can be very helpful, meaning that if the child gets into school, Perhaps they would um, be in a smaller classroom, maybe not be there the entire day, and then inch up into being there the entire day so that they can become desensitized to be going to school. More support in school can be very helpful, counseling, um, a trusted adult that they meet in the morning that helps them get settled. All of those things um, can help a child feel much more comfortable in school. Having a smaller area um, and decreased stimulation, so maybe um, going from class to class at a time when the other students aren't, so that there's not everyone in the hall, it's not so loud, it's not so chaotic. Um, and then the smaller setting can also be helpful. Medication is one of the treatments that can be very effective for children, adolescents, and adults. Um, most of our data is with adolescents, and the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are the core treatments that we use for anxiety disorders. Those that have the most data are fluoxetine and sertraline. Escitalopram is also getting quite a bit of data for anxiety and depression. And sometimes if there is a parent that has taken a medication that has worked particularly well, we use that as a method of understanding which medication to start with. The general idea is to start low and go slow. Some children and adolescents will be activated on the SSRIs, so watching for activation, watching for negative side effects, um, is important, um, and then inching up as they tolerate it. Benzodiazepines um, we don't use very often in kids, but sometimes they can be very helpful if used for a brief period of time um, for acute school avoidance, panic symptoms, while some of the other, both psychosocial as well as um, SSRIs or other medication trials are underway. Alpha agonists, guanfacine and clonidine um, may help kids, particularly those with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, to decrease the hyperarousal. Sometimes they're very helpful for sleep issues as well. And um, we do use them as a second line for ADHD, but they can be particularly helpful for kids who maybe have both of those disorders, anxiety disorder and ADHD, and um, aren't tolerating other ADHD medications. 
There's been a few case reports on buspirone, but there is not a wealth of evidence to suggest that it is that helpful for anxiety disorders in children. With that, um, I will open up the group for discussion. Thank you. I'm giving my I actually am hearing a lot of static, but I'm not. I'm not hearing a question. Yes, Dr. Sloan, we're still waiting for questions, yeah. Everyone has mic, whichever has okay. mic, mute everyone else. So, Kay has a question. A question. Uh, uh, if you have it now. I did not hear the question. Uh, yeah, they're just going to ask. They're yes. just up there. Okay, hi. Hi. Hi, Dorothy. Um, I'm Nazi and uh, thanks a lot for a wonderful open talk about anxiety disorders. I would like to have your comments uh, about the use of SSRI in children with autism spectrum who also have significant anxiety. This prediction in your experience is more suitable if you have to use medication along with the psychological work and that group of children. Um, thank you. I had a little trouble hearing. Um, I got the basic gist that you asked about autism disorder and anxiety. Yeah. Use of medication. The use of medications for people with autism who also have anxiety. Um, so for kids with autism, um, one can use the same medications as with other children to treat anxiety. The SSRIs can be used with children with anxiety disorders. They don't work as well as they do with adults, um, but they still are the core for um, helping anxious children with ADHD and, no, I'm sorry, with anxiety disorders. For those children that maybe also have um, ADHD and anxiety, um, there is data about either clonidine or guanfacine being helpful for those kids. It tends to lower the overall autonomic arousal, and sometimes that may be the medication that we start with because those two are so frequently found in autism. Um, did I answer the question? Hi. For more questions. Hello. Hello. 
हेलो हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम हेलो हेलो यस मैडम आई एम डॉक्टर Hello. Your voice is breaking up. If you can repeat the question, your voice was breaking up. You can also send the question in the chat box. Okay. Yes, we are right. Okay. Sure. Sure. okay. Dr. Dorothy, they are sending you the question in the chat box. Okay. Great. Have you sent it to Dr. Scoob or me? We sent all attendees. Okay, because I don't see it. No, nor do I. I'm afraid. Yeah, if you can send again. Okay. Not to all attendees. Try the either the host or the presenter. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Scoob. Yes, we we send. Oh, I see. What is the role of SNRIs in children suffering from anxiety disorder? Um, okay. Um, typically, SNRIs don't have the evidence base that we would hope they would have for children and adolescents. On the other hand, we do use them if the SSRIs are not effective. They may be um, usually a second or third line medication for treatment of anxiety and um, maybe even higher up if a parent who has anxiety has taken an SNRI and has um, had to be particularly effective. So SNRIs can be used, but they are not, in our country, they're not FDA approved and the um, evidence base isn't as great as we would like, but um, we still do use them um, as a secondary line for anxiety disorders. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from anyone else? Questions yeah. or comments? Comments are great too. Are there particular types of treatments that you found to be most effective? Have another question? Kindly let me know first, so that we don't end it. Yeah, I can you hear me? go ahead. Can you hear me? 
Um, I can. You break up a little bit, but yes. go ahead. Uh, you're regarding sort of an hour set of Quite often we do see a lot of conversion presentation or psychosomatic presentation in our setup, much more than in the West, in children and adolescents presenting with anxiety disorder. And the uh, majority of the time in clinical work, we end up working more with the parents because reinforcing behaviors are something which I end up working almost all the time. So family work, uh, much more important I came across here than the individual work. So it's a very close family network and how the problem is being reinforced um, or sort of, uh, so that sort of is pretty common. Yes. Especially um, in uh, conversions and yeah. um, We do see conversion symptoms in the U.S., but probably you are correct not as commonly. Um, we also see non-epileptic seizures, and I agree that the work with the family is very important. We always want to make sure that there isn't a trauma that may be um, precipitated the conversion symptoms, so really thinking about whether it also may include a post-traumatic stress disorder um, with a conversion disorder, I think, can also be quite helpful. Now, do you use medications such as SSRIs or benzodiazepines with these kids as well? Uh, depends on the severity of the symptoms. We do use SSRIs more, benzodiazepine if we have to in very short term. Right. But not generally. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds similar to here. Yeah, and PTSD, you are uh, right, we do come across many children with abuse uh, history or even following the Army Public School incident, we had many children presenting with severe anxiety but with mainly somatic, psychosomatic presentation including conversions to the seizures. Mm -hmm. so that was very common uh, in that group of children as well. Right. And I, I agree that helping the child um, manage their anxiety and the family really understand that this is not a a medical medical illness that they need to worry about in terms of the health but helping the family um, be reassuring and work with the child to keep them functioning is really that probably is the best treatment yeah. thanks a lot thank you Yes, Dr. Bakar. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stubi, for your wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure uh, our colleagues in Pakistan, and actually this is the first time we have colleagues from Qatar who have all, also joined the And Hello. I also, hi, and I especially want to acknowledge, I see a number of institutions online, there are about 10 institutions online, so just acknowledge uh, briefly, I see KEMU and Dr. Nazish and her team online, Dr. Sadaf at Fatma Jinnah Medical College and her team online. I see uh, both institutions of Dow online and Dr. and Professor Raza Rahman team online. And I see Dr. Lazari and Multan Children's Hospital team online. And there are a number of others, so I hope I'm not missing anyone. But uh, it was wonderful to see a great participation from our colleagues in Pakistan and Qatar. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stubi, for your presentation uh, this morning. Thank you all, and um, all the best in working with the kids and children and adolescents and their families that are suffering from anxiety. Goodbye. Oh. Just getting some.